places. It's stored in there as an index to the data. It's also stored as an index for the foreign key. So if your keys are too big, you're starting to chew up space real fast. And it's less efficient and, and all the problems with that. So by storing in a number here, we can then store a number as the foreign key, and that index is going to be more efficient too. So we just win all the way around. All right. Um, is that true um, even though, like, you know, let's say down the road when you want to write queries, but you'd have to do another join, let's say you just want to display the category name for the poll, where you, in essence, could write a select statement right against the poll table and display the category name without having to join the category table? Are there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, this is always like, confusing me, this topic. Yeah, that, it, 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 it's, it's possible that you lose a touch there, all right? But you probably don't lose all that much. So there might be the tiniest trade-off there, you know, but the gain that you have from using a numeric key, I'm sure would outweigh the loss that you would have for that, especially when you consider here. Like in this case especially, category, how many categories are we talking about? We're probably not talking about thousands. Probably not even talking about hundreds. We're probably talking about like 10 or so, you know, or, or whatever. So to, to do a join where it has to join and find something in another table of which there's, let's say, under 100 elements, that's a piece of cake for the database engine. And I would think any efficiencies that you gained from the numeric is going to be outweighed by the fact that, yeah, you have to do another join. All right, but that, yeah, that's a great question. Excellent question. All right, let's look at this. Let's think for a second. Are there any other constraints? We, we put on one constraint. What do I mean by a constraint? I mean a limitation. We actually have a couple limitations, or uh, maybe three limitations on what, based on what we have on the board now. One limitation is the primary key of this. So every row has to have one, it has to be unique. Likewise, a constraint is the primary key of this one. Every, one. every row has to have one, it has to be unique. This is another constraint, that the category ID in this table has to match up with the category ID in that table. That's a constraint. That's a limit. In other words, if I have categories 1 through 3 in here, I couldn't enter a poll in for category 4. I just can't do it. It's not like it's a bad idea. or what. You just can't. You can't. All right? Are there other constraints that I might want to put in this database? It's what we have so far in the database. Yeah, I probably want to make the category name unique also. Would you also want to make it mandatory that someone fills it in? I'd also want to make it required. So those are constraints I'll have. We'll come back to this in a second, how we're going to do it. Let's identify the constraints first. What about the poll? foreign key is required. Remember, by virtue of making a foreign key, that doesn't make it required. What it simply says is if you supply a value, it has to match up. So, again, think back to the spouse foreign key. Um, we're not saying that everyone has to have a spouse. We're saying if you do have a spouse, it has to match up with the spouse table or whatever the table the spouses are contained in. Um, so that's required. Yeah, that's required by virtue of the fact that it's a primary key. That goes along with it being a primary key. Probably one other constraint. Question. What about the question? Yeah, it has to be required. Uh, it, or it, 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 it is required. Do we want to make the question 
unique. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, I don't know. That would be that would be I could see it going either way. I could see someone saying, hey, if I ask a question once, I will, you know, I wouldn't want to answer, ask it again. Um, but I could also see someone saying, yeah, why not? Maybe later on down the line you'd want to ask a question again. You know, I don't know. Since since we're constrained to only one category per question, I would say no. That's a good point. I might ask, you know, there could be things across the line. You know, for example, um, um, things about um, internet privacy. That could be in a technology question. That could be in a uh, politics question. At that point, that became too big of a deal. You might say, hmm, is that one-to-many relationship actually valid? But we'll, we'll say it's valid. And, and we're not sure. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it not unique. All right? No big deal. How do we require a field? How do we make a field required in a database table? Okay, the statement made was, would we validate it through ASP.NET validations? And that's a great, I guess you didn't ask it as a question, but that's a great observation. And it's a tough question to answer because you have to make sure, you have to, you have to hear my whole answer. This isn't a yes or no question. Yes, are we go, yes we are going to validate. And we'll talk about why we're going to validate in a minute here. No, that's not going to be the only means of validation. All right, and we'll, t we'll talk about that in a second here. And the field that's set through the creation of the tables? Yeah, in other words, any database management system, when you create a table, you can specify certain attributes for a column. So you can specify the type of the column. You can specify whether it's required or not. So there's just a box to check. Now, I asked this question sort of leading. Thing to remember about the database is the more constraints you can build on the database level, the better off you are. All right? Why do I say that? Well, keep in mind the database in your organization, let's say, could be accessed by a whole bunch of applications. Right? Here I could have my polling website. That interacts with the database. All right. I could also have a desktop app for the employees of Polls R Us. that interacts with the database, that does things like, you know, allows them to add new categories in, you know, because you probably can't do that through the, the web interface. You can't really add a new category. Or you might be able to, but... Not without a CMS. Pardon me? Not without a content management right. system. Right. Yeah, so there might be a desktop application that does that, or a desktop a application to monitor for, like, abusive comments or whatever, all right? Or running reports. Or running reports. Exactly. So there could be a second application that hits this. And then there could be other applications as well. Again, it's kind of a stretch to come up with two applications in this particular case, but in a larger sort of uh, context, there can be a whole bunch of applications that hit up against the database. So keep in mind that no one accesses the database directly. People go through the DBMS. Now this is a little white lie in the case of access, but we'll go through, we'll go with that. If I can build the constraints here, I can guarantee that those constraints are enforced. All right? I can guarantee 
that no one, doesn't matter if they have a crowbar or if they go in through this application or that application, you can't force in a category that doesn't have a category name if I make it a database constraint. Doesn't matter what application. Any applications that exist now, any applications that anyone could dream up in the future, I can't force that in to that table. All right? If I were to build the validations here, let's say, for a specific thing, if I were to, if I were to simply validate in the application and enforce a constraint that way, all right, then this guy needs the exact same validations. Otherwise, we have the potential for corrupted data. All right? Anytime as a software developer you hear about something needing to be the same in two places, you know, the siren should go off. All right? Because what inevitably is going to happen is one of the things is going to get changed and the other one won't. Or one of them will get changed correctly and the second one will get changed incorrectly or whatever. So with two things, there's always a chance of inconsistency. If the constraints are enforced on the database level, you don't run the risk of, consistent, uh, of consistency issues. All right? I actually worked on a system. It was slightly different than this model because it didn't use a database. But I worked on a system that updated a set of data and the constraints were built in the application. All right? The, each, you know, all the constraints, like things like a customer, uh, an order has to have a valid customer number. Uh, a, a, a line item on that order has to have a valid product and all that. And we're, you know, we're good programmers, you know, some of us were. All right. Over time, all right, we would look and we would see, despite our best efforts and despite our mostly competence with programming, there were hundreds of orders without customers, line items without valid line items. Why? Because it's just hard to keep everything in sync. And that totally trashes the integrity of your data if you have something like that. All right. And again, you know, probably the oldest acronym in, in computer science, garbage in, garbage out. If your data is bad, anything that you pull from that data isn't going to be good. All right? So, we're going to put the constraints here to as great a degree as possible. All right? To a greater degree as possible. All right? That way, a constraint changes. For example, maybe we decide we do want to eliminate duplicate questions. Or maybe we originally started duplicate, uh, or prohibiting duplication, and we decide later we want to get rid of that. We only have to make that change in one place, and everything is OK. The foreign key is an example of a constraint. All, right? All these constraints are best built on the database level. Now, you might say, well, that's great. I don't have to validate it anymore, right? because the database is handling it. That's not true. I have heard people argue that, though. I have heard people argue that um, it's probably best not to do a lot of validation. Just let, just try to update the database and catch it if it fails. And I don't agree with that, especially in a web environment where you have a client-server environment and you can instantly give someone feedback that they forgot a category name or they forgot a question name, or they did not select a valid category for this question. So again, remember the whole model of data going through the web to the server, then coming back to the client. If we can catch an error on the client side and tell them right off the bat, hey, you know, this isn't valid, then you know, everyone benefits from it. The server doesn't have to worry about data that we know by definition is bad. All right? And the client gets an immediate response. So yes, we still have to do validation. All right. Let me check on the time. Eleven oh six. I think that 
just about covers this part of the example. All right, I'm trying to think if there are any other things that I wanted to focus on for this. Oh, one last thing. I feel like Steve Jobs now, right? Just finished his biography. One more thing. All right. How do I make sure that this is unique? you can specify whether the index is unique or not. All right? So I can say I could define an index for category name, and I can say, yes, I want it indexed, and yes, this is a unique index. And that will enforce the constraint that no two categories have the same name. All right? The other thing indexes uh, are good for are good for doing quick lookups, especially when you have a high volume of data. So, for example, you know, your primary key is, and you probably have heard this, anyone that's like maybe gone to the college or like you call about your electric bill or something, what's the first thing they ask you? What's your account number or what's your student number? Why? Because that's the primary key. That will identify you uniquely. But if you don't have that, what do they do? Okay, what's your phone number? What's your address, what's your first name, last name, whatever. They ask you some other piece of information. What's your email address? Now, if a field isn't defined as an index, the database literally has to look at the first record in the database, then the second record, then the third record, then the fourth record, until it gets a hit. All right? So if you're talking about a big table, like there's a lot of students here at LC, right? To look up if you don't have your student number and there was no index, let's say, for name, all right, it would literally have to go through all the students probably that are enrolled or probably have ever enrolled. All right. What's the student numbers up to? The student numbers are in the 500,000s, I think. Who has a student number in the 500,000s? Yeah, so it's half a million students probably. All right. Um, I won't tell you what my student number was, but it was five digits as opposed to uh, six digits. All right. Even I'm in six digits. Yeah, even yeah, you're in six <laughs> digits. Wow. You know, I probably had two or three students that have had a lower student number than me. And it's like, wow, respect. All right. The idea is, though, is that's called a sequential search, where you, where you simply search in sequence. That would be like if you went to the library and there was like no numbers on the books and no indexes. How would you find a book then? Well, you'd have to start the first shelf, look for the book, 
On the first shelf? No. Go to the second. Go. To the, you'd have to literally look through every book in the library until you found the one that you want. All right. An index sort of allows you to just jump right to a particular thing. So I could then quickly look up and find people by their name if that was created as an index. Now, it adds more overhead to the system. It makes every write a little bit, um, little, little, bit, little bit longer every time you update something. And now it has to update a couple different things, a database. All right. But it's good for the, the reason of doing quick queries. And it's also good for the reason that we can use that to enforce this unique um, this unique uh, constraint on the category name. The technical name for something like category name, by the way, is called a candidate key. All right, it's something that could be a key, but we didn't choose it. All right, so this is a primary, you know, either category ID or category name, both of them, either one of them could be the primary key to this. But we chose category ID for the reasons that we defined, but then we can make a, a unique index on it. The uh, primary keys automatically indexed? Uh, primary keys are automatically indexed, yes. Uh, foreign keys, I believe, are automatically indexed too. So the category ID. We talk a lot about eliminating redundancy. And when you eliminate redundancy, you're talking about duplicated data, that you don't have to change multiple things if just one tiny thing changes. And we talked about that earlier when we talked about not putting a category name directly in the poll table. We said if we, change, if we wanted to change from baseball to Major League Baseball, if the category name was part of the poll, we'd have to go and find every question that had baseball as a category and change it to Major League Baseball. Now, this, some students get confused and say, well, isn't this a case of redundancy? I have a category ID here and a category ID here. And it really isn't. It's needed there to create a relationship. There is a relationship between question and category, and we need to show that. Or put differently, these really aren't the same thing. In other words, there's really two different pieces of data here. The piece of data here says, I have a category named technology, and its ID is one. I have a category named sports. So this is a list of valid categories. This simply says this particular poll belongs to this category. So it's two sort of different things. All right. I guess there's a little more about that. We could we could talk about that, like the, the every database concept. I think with these two tables, but one. I guess uh, the many many relationship. We'll have to say that one for another day. Now. We run into a problem of what if I what if I had a technology category and I had ten questions in the poll table for technology? What happened if, what would happen if I tried to delete that technology category? So you know because you have poll questions that are dependent on this category. Well, actually, the answer is a little bit that, that's part of the answer. It might do that. It might do something else, depending on how you set it up. Well, it could say, okay, and just be all your questions. Down. Right. <laughs> all right. You have two choices when you implement it. At least in, 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 depending on the database, in some databases you actually have a third choice. But typically you have, uh, or often you have two choices at least, and then sometimes a third. One is to do what's called cascade delete. That means when you delete the parent, it deletes all the related rows in there. So if I set it up for cascade delete, if I deleted a category and there were poll questions out there, if I set up for cascade delete, it would delete all the poll questions for that. And what's more, if I had other tables hanging off of that and they were also <coughs> cascade delete, I could delete comments, I could delete votes, I could delete a lot of things. My other option is to restrict. And by restricting, that says I can't delete a category until, uh, or I'm sorry, I can't delete a category if there are polls associated with it. So if 
I wanted to get rid of a category. Let's say I was merging technology into a new category called science and technology, for example. I would have to move everything over to the, move all the poles over from technology to science and technology, then I could delete the, the, the original technology category. Some databases offer the option of nulling out the primary or the foreign key. Um, that wouldn't work in this case because the category ID is uh, required. But like, you know, um, you know, in other cases, you know, where it was an optional field, you could just like set it to null. Like maybe between faculty member and advisor, or, or, or a faculty advisor and student. You know, you don't have to have a, an advisor, let's say. So if the advisor retires, it would simply null it out. Not all databases have, have that capability. Important thing to remember is that the, the, the cascade delete and restrict delete works in one direction. Works from the deleting the parent, what happens to the children underneath it. I could delete a poll. If these were the only two tables, I could delete a poll and it doesn't, you know, and it'll delete it regardless of the, you know, regardless of what category it's associated with. Now, there's soon going to be other tables coming off of the poll, so we're going to have that problem with those tables as well. Would you cascade delete? in this case? Yes or no? I probably wouldn't. Um, you'd have to know more about the, the requirements of the application and the, the, the desires of the people that are going to be using this database before you came to a conclusion on that. All right. Let's try to at least get the rest of the tables and relationships up here. All right. We've addressed this one. It only took about an hour. <laughs> so that means we got about four more hours to go on, on this one. What do we learn for this one in terms of entities and relationships and so on? You need a user entity. You need a user entity. Again, I'm pretty sure we need a user entity because, first of all, there's probably going to be several things that I want to store about a user, not just the fact that Mike voted on this. All right, so uh, I want to do that. Um, I also, if I scanned ahead, I saw the users can do other things other than vote. So I want to do that. There's a sense of a constraint here that there has to be a user associated with a vote. All right, so there's a constraint there. All right. What other entities do we have here? Can we glean from that first thing? Have to be logged on as a user to vote in a poll. Can they make a vote? Vote. All right. Relationships between poll and vote. Many up here or many down there? One poll can have how many votes associated with it? Many, right? Because everyone can make their own vote. A given vote, one vote is associated with how many polls? Just one. So it's a one to many going in that direction. What about between user and vote? Okay, so they can have many votes. A user can have many votes, but only one vote. But one vote is associated with the user. Now, 